Welcome. This is the third video in the series where I will explain about uh, measuring. I like to say that uh, one good measurement is better than a thousand expert opinions, which is often the truth. And when you start to build a wheel, you need to choose spokes of the optimal length. It's bad if they are too long or too short because you don't want. Uh, I will demonstrate it here. You don't want to end up with having the nipples only slightly engaged, in case you choose spokes that are too short, or to have them go too far out, because here at this point, when this is level, this is, these are 20 millimeter uh, nipples, for the 14 and 60 millimeter nipples you start even deeper, but here this is as far as it goes. After this, I am not using any threads, but the, this nipple is starting to move against this and nipple threads are being destroyed and the spoke is being scratched. So when you choose optimal length of spokes, you have all the threads engaged, but and that is the, the best choice to make a strong wheel. The, the smallest percentage of probability for any breakage at the nipple is achieved that way. So that is why it's important to choose the right length of spokes. And the wheel building in general is usually explained like sort of a mysterious art but it's really in spite of these videos being probably a bit long and tedious I again must recommend the books that I mentioned but uh, it's simple process basic mechanics and geometry are used and I think that a 12 year old child can following the instructions build a perfectly good wheel and I haven't put that to the test, but my son is, my son is still, still, still too young, but I will. Anyway, uh, let's get back to the point. When it comes to measuring and generally building wheels, first thing I want to point out is one caveat. And for this example, I will use one old hub. But for hubs that are uh, attached by quick release, they have hollow axle. And the thing is that when you close the quick release, these ends of the hub will be a bit pressed together more. So what happens is that the hub can start to turn very diff with, with great difficulty and the bearings will get damaged if you do not uh, apply enough, pre enough preload. When, when doing, dealing with these hubs, you need the hubs to be a bit loose and have a bit of play when, they are, when the quick release is, is open, but when you close it, you want the plate to disappear. Having too much preload or having too little, so when the quick release is closed, they also still have play, is not good. Out of the factory, in my experience, many of the cup and cone hubs, even the high and Shimano ones, don't come with properly reset preload. And you want to do that first before doing any measurements or building wheel. And when you are building wheel and checking for trueness, if there's play in the, in the hub, the rim will move left, right, not because you haven't trued it properly, but because of the play in the, in the bearings. So you want to make sure that's eliminated when you are building a wheel. So the tools I use are these old spacers. I put them on the hub's ends and place a quick release inside and close it so I can quickly check if, if, there's, uh, if the play has been eliminated. And I can also check by turning them using hand if it is too tight, if there's too much preload, so they don't turn smoothly. So it's a bit of a trial and error, but that's one thing to make sure that your component, your main component, the hub is, has proper preload. This one has full uh, axle, it, it's not hollow. It is, but the, not enough, the walls are not too thin for, the, for there to be any me meaning, meaningful compression extra. So in this case, I just can check for play like, like this and this one looks looks okay now. I will double check it once the wheel build is finished because it's not easier to, to check for that when you have the whole uh, wheel and the tire mounted to, to use as a lever. But for the wheel building process, for me, it's important to not have any, any plate that will make things more difficult and uh, make me think that the wheel is out of true when there's play in the bearings while the spokes are properly tensioned. So that's one thing now, back to the measurement. First thing to do is 
to measure something that's called the effective rim diameter. And what is that is when you put the spokes in the spoke holes, how much diameter does the wheel have in that play, in, in, in that uh, situation. So the outer or the inner diameter are not relevant for wheel building purposes, but only the effective rim diameter. That is the proper technical term for, as far as I know. So how do that? For that, I have used these two old spokes. They were cut to exactly 20, millimeter, uh, 20 centimeter length for practical purposes. But as long as you know the exact length, it's, it's all good. You can make it 15 if you build some smaller wheels or make them longer or whatever. And then I screwed the nipples in so that the end of the spoke aligns with this inner side of the nipple so it doesn't protrude. I'm not sure if you can catch it on the camera, but that's the point. After that, I just pinched it with some cable cutters and to hold the nipples in place so they don't move. Before doing that, I even put some uh, thread locking glue. So, I got some basic measuring tools and another thing I did, this is probably a bit of exaggeration, but for me it uh, makes it easier to check if the rim is okay. I, I have drawn this for various rim dimensions so that I can more easily see if everything is, is fine in all directions. So I just align the spoke holes and see the outside if it all aligns properly. Checking the distance between the markers to see if it's so if it is nice and, and round or if it has some sort of deformation. But there is a, another way to, to do that, and that is just to measure across several, several braces, which we will do now. So the first thing to do is take two, another thing that is, that this helps me with, that is the, the primary reason, is that it now allows you to easily see what are, what the opposing spoke holes are. So I'm putting this one in one opposing hole, and the other one in the other. Let's just show it on this rim for the camera. This is what I'm trying to do. I want to put this inside the hole and all the way in. I don't want it being like this or something, but I want it all the way in so I can get a proper measurement like it will be when the wheel is built and it's all laced up. So here is what I will do, I'll put another one here, I'll move to, to, to allow the camera to show. Place it inside, and now we need a ruler. Okay. This one is as good as any. Okay, so now I'm pulling on one spoke. You can use even some sort of rubber rubber band to make sure these are pulled together and now I will align the top one or the left hand side one on the video uh, 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 with the zero and the other one is showing 21.2 millimeters okay so these are 20 millimeters so together they make 40 millimeters 40 centimeters sorry and 21.2 so that is uh, 612 millimeters. Okay, that is the, the effective rim diameter of this one. See, 612. Okay, now let's make another measurement along this side just to be sure that there's no deformation during the rim. Again, doing the same procedure. That's it, 612 millimeters. Okay, we will write that down. The most important tool for wheel building is 
fan and the paper. ERD. Sorry for my awful handwriting. 612 millimeters. Now we know that these hubs we will use and the rims have 32 spokes. Okay? And we will choose spokes that have 1.8 millimeter thick midsection. That is important for calculations later. Okay, so those are some things that we know up front. And now let's go to the other measurements that are important. In this box, it doesn't get damaged. Okay, good. We need to measure the, the hubs we are using. And the important measurements are how far the right hand side flange and the left hand side flange are from the middle of the of the hub because that will affect the spoke length whether they go at a greater angle or more straight up this right hand side for the rear wheels is usually a bit closer to the middle and how the easiest way to measure that at least in my experience is the following first thing is i want to measure the what's called over the lock nut distance, but for uh, the hubs with cartridge bearings, there is no lock nut, but the, that is the name for this part that goes on the inside of the frame in, of the dropout. So the hub rests against this. So that's what I want to measure. And let's see about this one. And this is 120 millimeters, 12 centimeters. I will double check this with the factory details because factories usually um, disclose information about the important dimensions of house but for rims uh, in my experience you should never take for granted what the factory says but always do your own measurement for the particular ring that you are building the wheel with and uh, because there are some discrepancies differences and that is problem later when you start lacing. If the spokes are too short, you will have problems lacing. If they are too large, as I explained in the beginning of the video, you will have problems tightening the, the nipples. So, this is the first thing. We have 120 millimeters. And I will write it down. That's over the lock nut distance. 120 millimeters which divided by the two is 60 millimeters. And that is important for the later calculations of the flanges offset from the mid part of the, of the hub, as we will explain now. Now let's measure the, the other important things. Well, I, I think you can catch it on... I want to thank my friend Sergeant for for taking the time and the effort to record all this drivel and having the patience and it's it's real help thank you and please if you can take a, a picture of this because i wrote it down here that is the principle we have over the lock nut distance divided by two this is for example 135 millimeter rear hub that has asymmetrical you see this one the right hand side is more towards the middle and the left hand side is is more away and so what I want to do is take this half then measure this distance because that's easier to measure and then when I deduce uh, that from this one I get how much it is offset so that's the basic and I've marked all the important measures like A, B, C and D so I always use that principle so I don't get confused you can use your own uh, numeration or whatever so the first thing to do, as I marked here with an A, is a left hand side flange distance between nipple holes. Now this is difficult to measure if you try to get from middle to middle. You cannot align the tool very easily, but what I do is try to take a measurement of the top of both, and that gives more accurate reading. Trying to align it just perfectly. Okay, I think I've got it. And this is 
67 millimeters exactly. Okay, I'll measure on one more, in one more place just in case. Yeah, 67 millimeters. I'm writing it down. I just mark it as A because it's easier for me. That's what did I say? 67, 67 millimeters. Then we'll measure B. Let's see, so that is the, the right hand side to measure it. And it's the same. They look the same and when measured they are the same. Okay. So again 67 millimeters. Okay. It's not always the same, so you should measure both. Now we have C and D. As, as I explained for calculating C and D, we need to take the the half of the over the Lochner distance width, so it's always 60 minus what we measure. And now we will measure this. So in order to measure this distance from here to this midsection here, as accurately as possible, this is the way I do it. You can figure out your own way, but for me this works. First we'll measure the, the left hand side, okay? Take this, and take this, trying to make sure it's properly aligned, and then just take the measurement, trying to hold this parallel so it doesn't move left or right, and trying to keep this at the same, at the same level, it is a bit, can be a bit tricky. I'm sure this is a bit annoying to watch, but I find it quite meditative. Okay, this is 19 millimeters from what I could measure, and I will take another measurement just to confirm. Yes, that looks about right. Okay, so it's 19 millimeters. And then what we do, it's simple maths. So it's 60 minus 19, that's 41. Okay, so we measured the left hand side, now we need to measure the right hand side now. Okay, let's read. Okay, this is 29 millimeters. So it's a bit further, a bit closer to the center. So it's like minus 29, so it's 31. That's quite quite some distance, quite some difference. So we will have difference in spook tension and length for the left and right hand side spooks. For the front cuffs, if they use disc brakes, you will see the opposite scenario where the left hand side flange, where there needs to be provided enough space for the disc of the disc brake, you will see the left hand head flange be moved further, closer to the center. But for the rim brakes and front wheels, they are usually symmetrical, but it doesn't hurt to double check, just in case. So never take anything for, for granted. Now we need to measure one more thing for this to be accurate enough, that is the the size of this hole because it also affects how high the spoke will move and so for this I use this primitive method okay and it's as often is for Shimano hubs it's 2.6 millimeters so that's the flange hole 2.6 millimeters okay now we have all the measurements and the important thing to do is to do the right calculations. Now for this spoke thickness is important because spokes will elongate more under tension if they are thinner and for spokes that are, it's called butted spokes that have thinned midsection, the important part for calculation is the thickness of that thinned down midsection. So even though the ends of the spokes that we intend to use will be 2 millimeters, the middle is 1.8, so we'll take that as a factor when we calculate the 
this, the spoke dimension. So we have the number of spokes and we have all the other important measurements. Now we need another thing before we do calculations. We need to decide how many crosses we will do because it's not the same if the spokes go straight from the hub to the, to the rim and as it is when they move one, one across or two or three across because it will take longer spokes. And for some front wheels, front wheels, they, they, they don't use these brakes, so they don't generally carry that much load. But they do when you're braking. When you're braking hard, all the load is on the front wheel. So I don't recommend underestimating the quality and the strength of front wheels, but in general, you can get away with uh, making up for uh, non having, not having available appropriate spoke, spoke lengths by playing with different cross patterns. You can even get away with radial spoking, but if you don't have long enough spokes, instead of lacing three across, you can lace two or even one across, and it will work for the front wheel most of the time, if you do it all properly. And uh, for this uh, situation, as I explained in the first video, we have 32 spokes, so that divided by nine gives us three point something, so we will go three across. So that's another thing to note, the lacing pattern, three across. Okay, and now we come to another exotic thing. And first, before I forget, there are some frames that have, especially at the rear part, some offset. Because as we shown on, on in the first video, with the right hand side flange being too close to the middle, and the right hand side spokes needing to have a lot of tension to, to make uh, the rim move and stay in the middle, while the left hand side spokes having not enough tension and hence resulting in a wheel that is more easy, uh, will more easily take any load from, from one side than the other, and generally making a bit of a compromise in terms of wheel's strength. And because it's generally very popular to have more and more sprockets in the back, for reasons I don't think are all that sensible. I wrote on that on our website, I will post a link. Anyway, the man, some manufacturers have made frames that are a bit offset, so the frame is moved a bit to the, to the right-hand side, so that the tension between right, left and right-hand side spokes can be more even. So in order to have the ring in the middle, you need the when you look at the flange, uh, at the hub itself, to have the, the rim be a bit to the left more. And when you have a rim like that, a bicycle like that, a frame like that, you need to account for that in the calculations. For those situations, I will probably write down, I will not go and explain that in this video. Uh, it, to be honest, I really don't know out of the top of my head, because I don't uh, build many wheels for such frames. But for other exotic things, I will explain. Now, first thing we need to take into the account is <coughs> that some rims have uh, hub, of, uh, sorry, uh, have spoke holes uh, pun punctured at one side or the other. It's usually for fat bike wheels that are very, very uh, thick, and in that case, they will be a bit offset from the from the middle. You can usually rely on that data on the manufacturers website of the rim manufacturers or you can measure it yourself and you need to write that down and take it into consideration that would be like rim uh, sorry rim hole offset from the middle and you want that to be a bit to the to the left hand side for the for the rear wheels okay and another thing is to see it's best seen from the inside you see these holes are like one is a bit to one side the other is to the other and that difference that's called the asymmetry, asymmetries or whatever is proper pronunciation, that needs to be also measured and taken into account. So that's one thing to, to pay attention to. And another thing is that some uh, spoke holes are angled. When they are put at a certain angle, you need to be uh, aware of that when you're lacing the wheel, but it's not that important for the measurement unless they are put on the adjacent sides of the of the the rim while the the one say the one 
for this is meant to go to the left hand side spoke some manufacturers do that actually so you need to to take that into consideration and now we will get to this for this rim in particular we need to, to measure this difference and so you will, you will try to measure it we'll take one and they both started seven millimeters on the end and let's see about this difference that's about eight millimeters so they are both a bit half a half a millimeter moved away from the center so we will use that for our calculation that makes one millimeter total difference and we'll double check with the manufacturer's data on that to be sure for the for the rim manufacturer okay so now we will do our calculations so okay so now we'll use a calculator just need to use the mouse okay so this is easier done using a computer okay so this is the the place where link i will post this in the in the section now we need to choose like what kind of spoke are using and in this case we're using normal spokes with j band at the elbow and we want to build the rear wheel um, this is for our own convenience you can say like remain age something and now we need to use the the measurements we have taken so for half diameter both left and right are 67 millimeters for flange offset the left one is 41 the right one is 31 millimeter spoke hole diameter that's 2.6 effective rim diameter 612 millimeters asymmetry that we have like uh, this is the he gives good explanations for various measurements here so you can just click here and and see what what it's about sometimes he, uh, here it shows nicely pictures with explanations anyway let's get back to the topic asymmetry we established to be 0 0.5 millimeters width between holes is that's important width between holes is one millimeter okay and frame offset is zero and the number of spots left and right and spoke diameter we're going with 1.8 and let's see what the calculation says okay here we have the calculation for the left and the right hand side spokes the left hand side spoke says 295.9 and the right hand size spoke says 294.5 now the author of this calculator and the Ford machine book recommends uh, rounding to the to the nearest whole number or even number if you usually have only even size spokes uh, I might be wrong but the last time I looked up something like that was recommended in my experience it's uh, because here I only can source the even uh, even number size spokes so it's like 294, 296, 298, and so on. So I can go only make two millimeter adjustments, and I always go for the nearest even number. And in case that is not close enough for the for the smallest one, so in this case, like 295.9, I would go for 296. So I write down what I got using the calculator and round it out to 296 and for the right hand side spokes i got 294.5 but i will go with 294 i will not go for the 296 for the right as well if it were uh, 295 point something closer i would round up but in this case i run round down to the nearest even number i have in my experience it's, it's turned out fine and in the worst case scenario, I can use 
uh, longer nipples, like 40 millimeters one or 60 millimeter ones to compensate for that, because it's that's something that I can easily store and find and source here while the the appropriate size pokes are a bit more tricky to find in Serbia. So it's 294.5 to round it up to 294 millimeters. So that is for for our calculation and he gives warning in case there's overlap. I'll just demonstrate that. So let's say we do this wheel with four, four spokes across on both sides and recalculate you have a warning like spoke head will overlap by a lot so it's it's a very good calculator and it's worked for me so far very good so that's it when it comes to measuring now we need to find spokes buy spokes and build the wheel and thank you for watching the next video will be about lacing wheels and cheers